Okay. I think we can start. Fantastic to see you all. Welcome to this final session uh, of our two day conference. No pressure. It's up to you to really uh, draw everything together and, uh, and, and provide meaningful insights and conclusions for the way forward. This is the second uh, part of the conference, meaning we are looking uh, at the EU's functioning. What kind of uh, polity do we want this to be? How do we want to improve its legitimacy? Do, do we need to improve its legitimacy? And indeed, how shall we do that? And we have a fantastic uh, lineup of speakers and panelists. Um, so it's uh, going to be a great discussion. I'm absolutely sure of that. Uh, I will introduce everybody now so that then we can uh, just keep going um, as the as the panel progresses. First of all, we are very pleased to have with us Alexander Turk, Professor of Law at King's College London, uh, who will speak to us about the EU's various normative spaces in which the EU produces its norms, which I think is a very compelling concept. So very much look forward to that. Um, we have with us Christopher Lord uh, for uh, from Arena in Oslo, um, who will look at the the legitimacy of EU decision making and delegation, and um, who had some icily poignant words in his contribution that I, I would just like to to say here, to recite here. Uh, I think they're a bit of a cold shower for the EU institutions, uh, and, and I, I like that. It says, of course, the EU could get round democratic legitimacy by claiming some other form of legitimacy. Technocratic legitimacy the, is the obvious alternative, but that would require more than a claim to better knowledge. It would also presuppose a claim to better ethical and moral understanding. Such a claim would be as preposterous as it is obnoxious. It would deservedly fail. So that's a nice scene setter for his contribution in a moment. Um, we are also very happy to have with us Michael Keating, Jean Monnet Chair and Professor at the University of Duisburg Essen, whose project will explore the dynamic and flexible nature of the EU's cooperation with third countries through EU agencies as a form of external differentiation of the future of Europe driven by a logic of functional sector specific interdependence. Wow, I look forward. It's your own words. Uh, <laughs> I look forward uh, to understanding even more, you know, in, in concreto what that will mean. And our final paper giver then is Richard Crow, head of unit in the legal service of the European Parliament, um, who will be discussing the EU budget uh, and particularly the breakthrough next generation EU, which he considers is an opportunity to demonstrate the capacity of the union's institutional framework to manage such responsibilities in the common interests of all member states and its citizens. Uh, a grand uh, claim uh, again, and I very much look forward to seeing that fleshed out. And after the presentations of these outstanding speakers, we will have an expert panel to provide their comments and shine their lights on, their, on, on the issues under discussion with, uh, first of all, um, Mayor Paul Magnet, uh, Mayor of the city of Charleroi, and of course, very well known for his role in uh, the CETA discussions. Um, then we have Maria Jose Martinez Iglesias, director in the European Parliament Legal Service, visiting professor at the College of Europe Law Department and a recurrent panelist uh, in our conferences over the years. Great to see you again. Then I am I'm personally thrilled to welcome Ellen Voss, professor of EU law at Maastricht and one of my professors of EU law when I was a student in Maastricht about 20 years ago. Um, and last but not least, we are again, uh, of course, joined by one of our excellent students. It is Frédéric uh, Lachaise from the law department, uh, making us proud, I expect, this time. Um, so this is a superb menu, I think, that we have. I will just remind all our attendees out there in cyberspace that they can at all times ask their questions in the Q&A. Um, 
and indeed they can then be collected uh, by Olivier and posted to the speakers and the panelists. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Alexander Turk and give the floor to him. Thank you very much. I've now seen that I can also share my screen, which is amazing what technology can do. I'm, I'm honored and very pleased to be here and to have been invited to give a paper. I've got the rather long title given Legislative Delegated Acts, Comptology and Interinstitutional Conundrum EU Law. I shortened that to normative spaces. So what I will try to do is try and share my screen with you. So you see a picture of Hampton Court. There's no metaphor here, of course. Um, and let me just see if I can start from the beginning. Okay. Can everybody see that, Sasha? Yeah. Okay, very good. So here's the long title, which I've shortened to normative spaces, because I thought this is all um, stuff that sort of occurs within the union space. And uh, sort of there are three parts to what I'm going to talk about is generally how do normative spaces operate in a constitutional system? What happens in the EU system? And how do we configure these spaces in union law? Now, my paper is not one with the definitive answers. My paper is, is there to raise um, questions, highlight issues, and then maybe at the end propose a few solutions. So first up, what, what do we actually think are normative spaces? Well, spaces where legal norms are made at its very simplest. The question that fascinates me um, in this theme is who actually creates how? So what are the influences? Because we think immediately of constitutions or treaties that make them, but the picture is rather more complicated and at times also more disturbing. So what I try to explore is what kind of configurations of actors, norms and processes exist within those spaces and what impact do those spaces have on other spaces? How do they interact? And then who determines the scope and impact? And here we're thinking about courts, but again, the picture is rather much more complicated. So if you are left puzzled, but basically you're confused, but hopefully confused at a higher level. That is what I'm trying to do here. Um, so normative systems as uh, spaces in constitutional systems, um, we all know that modern lawmaking requires a complex system of normative spaces with a wide variety of configurations. Um, now, the trick, of course, is that constitutions are to provide roadmaps about who um, about the creation of those normative spaces. So we have references to who is the legislator. We might have the occasional reference basically to administrative um, basically actors, although in some constitutions that is very rare and they're usually much more modern. Um, so these spaces in the constitution um, will be somehow limited and uh, Normally, the constitution provides for delegation chains. In other words, delegations to the legislator, the legislator is then allowed to delegate further on. But constitutions are usually silent on many of these delegation problems, so courts will need to step in. What principles do apply when these delegation chains start to operate? What is the contribution of courts? My argument will be fairly limited or much more limited than people think because there are a lot of informal mechanisms that will kick in. So how central is legislation? And um, I would say it's much more limited than we believe. There is a dominance of administrative rulemaking in all its variety and glory. Um, and then there is traditional rulemaking, which often hides behind the fictions. Courts do not make laws. I tend to disagree and probably we all disagree. The question is to what extent do courts actually make law rather than whether they do. There is also private party rulemaking, which is invisible. It's often not clear. It's usually done through presumptions in the law, but often not made explicit. And then every sort of system has its transnational spaces where it actually reaches into international or transnational normative spaces. So how does this work in the European Union? 
Um, I argue that the complexity of normative spaces is as high, if not higher, because of the federal nature of it, um, than in national constitutional systems. So how are these normative spaces created? Well, you will say there are the treaties and we look to those. And yes, there's a high level of prescription, much, much higher than in national constitutional systems. But often it isn't clear what the guiding principles are in the treaties. And there are conflicts between the rule of law, democracy and federalism and other principles that compete um, basically about the creation of spaces. But then we find silence in the treaties. So we look for judicial determinations, the Court of Justice. But often we find there are informal political arrangements. So if you are familiar with the work of Thomas Christians, you know he has explored this to quite some considerable extent. What I also found interesting here is the hybrid arrangements that now take place in some part inside, in some part outside, international agreements that reflect and inform the EU and the EU is involved in these international agreements. So my point would be a legal system in transition, um, basically, and I will try to explain what I mean by that. So obviously legislation is central in the space, or at least we are made to believe it is central. I don't actually agree with this. Uh, but when we look at this space, we will see a surprising variety of configurations. My bugbear are the special legislative procedures for which I see no particular rationale. My point would also be, while it made sense for the Commission to have an exclusive right of proposal, the Commission needs to redefine and re-justify what that current rationale is. And here I basically would have doubts and there is room for improvement, I would have thought. The question then is also the legitimacy of the process, which we think is a highly legitimate space, uh, but that depends on the actors and the procedure, and that links to the strength of Parliament and also that first reading is now the norm. And you read the treaties, you think the second and third reading, but that rarely ever happens. So the question is, transparency in first reading becomes then key, what happens in trial laws and so on. Then there are the official administrative spaces, the known knowns, as probably Rumsfeld would call them. Um, and we know there is 290 and 291, and I don't need to basically hark on about this, but maybe just to abstract, that the idea is an executive rulemaking model with democratic control, almost a centralized federal executive model. And that would represent sort of a particular more recent vision of a unit of a union normative space closer to what you find in constitutional systems. Alongside that, you have 291 implementing acts follows a different logic of administrative rulemaking with national control what I would dub the integrated administration model or the integrated administrative model. That represents geologically much older model of a union normative space. So um, what do we know about these systems? Sounds good in practice, it uh, sounds good on paper, but in practice it hasn't worked. Why? Because of the blurring of the lines. The first blur is a vertical blur. The legislator basically retains essential elements. I'm still not sure, having all read all the case law, whether that is an organizing constitutional principle. I venture to say no. It's rather a signaling tool of the court because we only have very, very few cases in which the court stepped in to prevent abuse. So unlike, say, the German constitutional court has used this principle much more forcefully, the court has been much more reluctant to step in. It has used it, but it's more a signaling tool. There are horizontal blurs. We all know basically about the difficulties um, of the respective scope. We cannot distinguish supplemental from implementing acts in any clear fashion. The courts have retreated out of this with great enthusiasm. The first case, the court was asked to say, well, it's not our problem and has left it to the actors. That has left to a competing arrangement of inter-institutional arrangements, which also are not entirely clear to any practicing lawyer. The second blur is that, that the models start to blur. National experts take up rules in Article 290. So we are moving more of a model of integrated administration. On the other hand, in 291, we see moves towards a more executive, basically, um, uh, feature. So the two models blur and we can't distinguish the one from the other. 
So traditional retreat, I've called this, as to solving the blurs. I think the court has not been successful to unblur these lines, and that has given space to interinstitutional agreements. Now, the known unknowns, as Rumsfeld would call them, uh, the less official spaces. The Court of Justice I've put in there because often the Court of Justice says, well, we're not creating spaces. But yes, the court does. Um, so we'll need to explore which spaces in particular, and we can have a discussion about that. Then I've given each of these spaces labels. You may disagree with the labels or not. Last year's model, but resistant to change, the regulatory procedure is scrutiny. Why is it still there? Then there's the new shadow administration, which now rivals the commission, certainly on occasion has replaced the comitology system, even for implementing acts, look at financial services law. Um, and then basically there is now the danger of replacing the commission wholesale in certain areas. Um, then I could call had a lot of promise, but seems in decline. What happened to the open method of coordination? Um, lots of academics love it, but probably practitioners seem to be less keen on it. And from a legitimacy point of view, I'm also more skeptical about it. And then there are normative spaces dominated by private actors and private parties, in particular technical harmonization and so on. And then there is the dubbing of what administrative law is called application. Application can be a normative space, and I'm happy to elaborate if need be. And then these hybrid arrangements, which I call the new federal fudge. So which configurations for which normative space? And there are many more spaces out there, which are the unknown unknowns, as Rumsfeld would probably call them, which we don't even know exist. And probably you know quite plenty of them. So which actors, norms and processes for which space? What are the guiding principles of creating these spaces? So which actors and norms and processes? What's the balance between democratic legitimacy, the rule of law, federalism and effectiveness that we need um, to occupy? Who determines the normative space? Is it member states when actually discussing the treaties? Is it union institutions formally or informally or courts? Is these, the CJU an effective arbitrator in basically cases of contestation or is the political process better suited? I argue the court is not a well-suited space. The court is good at signaling about principles, but when it comes down to details, the court often is not in a position to basically be a forum to drive the importance and solve contestation. Which instruments should be used? Treaties, formal, legislative acts, formal instruments, inter-institutional agreements, or coffee chats behind closed door in between core repair meetings, or basically um, um, documents that are non-papers and so on. Is informal arrangement favorable or infavorable? Often it doesn't trans um, um, contribute to transparency, but sometimes essential for the system to work. And how do you control delegation chains. I don't think the union has quite yet cracked the essential elements doctrine. And what on earth does precisely delineated means when we delegate powers to agencies? So these are problems that need to be resolved in order for the union to have a consistent approach to normative spaces. I hope I have kept within my 10 minutes. This is very difficult for academics, you know that, Sasha. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Alexander. Um, you ask, where, what happened to the OMC? Uh, well, I can share with you that when I started working in the European Commission, um, I also asked myself the same question and I, I started to like physically look for it. Where is this OMC? This, the social OMC, for instance, where is it? And it turns out uh, it's all been subsumed in the European semester, right? So we no, no longer really de facto have any OMCs, but only one huge monster OMC, and that is the European semester. Okay, so let's move on to our second speaker, Christopher Lord, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I was asked whether we should further democracy Union decision making. I think the only possible answer is yes. 
Of course, we must do that if all citizens are to control the making and administration of all union policies and laws through representatives citizens themselves elect as equals. As well as making laws, the union makes decisions about values. Union decisions create winners and losers. They shape who gets what. They make large scale collective choices about economic and social models. They define rights. They affect people's identities. They redistribute between member states, regions, social groups and generations. Yet, a need for its decisions to be democratically controlled does not mean that the European Union needs to be a democracy, as opposed to a body that is controlled by its component national democracies. For some people, the Union's attempts to create democratic institutions and democratic politics of its own have been one huge mistake. Democracy requires a people. Democracy requires a state. The European Union has neither. So critics say the Union struggles to develop its own complete system of representation in which elections, parties and parliaments all fit together, all interact together in ways that enable voters to exercise public control as equals over union decisions. For some then, representative institutions at the European level are just a Potemkin village. They're just an illusion of how citizens can control the offering, amendment and implementation of their own laws through representatives. European elections, it is argued, do not do enough to stimulate competition for the people's vote, structured around choices relevant to the powers of the Union itself. Preoccupied with building grand party coalitions, cross-party coalitions and grand cross-institutional coalitions with the Commission and Council, sheltered from much linkage between their own chances of re-election and their own record in the last European Parliament or their promises for the next European Parliament, yet anxious to please national parties who control their careers. It is said members of the European Parliament are said to form the kind of Parliament it, for all of those reasons, for all of those reasons, it is said the European Parliament is the kind of Parliament you would expect in a European Union of cartel parties, more interested in restricting competition than articulating it. If conditions for democracy only exist within the democratic state, it might seem obvious that further democratization of union decisions needs to be centred on democratic institutions and politics within the member states rather than at European Union level. What, however, that argument ignores is just how much democracy at the national level may itself depend on some kind of European Union with its own representative institutions. First, national democracies need to be able to manage externalities. National democracies need to be able to manage externalities between themselves if they are to meet their most basic obligations to their own publics to secure rights, justice, freedom from arbitrary domination and democracy itself. Closely interconnected democracies, closely interconnected democracies such as those of the European Union, may struggle to provide their own publics with rights against polluters, monopolists, tax evaders, terrorists, traffickers, discriminators or spreaders of hate if those sources of arbitrary domination are located in other states. Those externalities may then make it hard 
to provide justice in the Rawlsian sense of how well the overall structure of laws, public policies and opportunities in a society all fit together, all hang together to provide a more or less fair scheme of cooperation, a more or less fair and just society in which citizens can live their lives. If finally it is an ideal of democracy that citizens should be able to define the terms of their own living together, democracies may need means of managing interstate externalities if their citizens are to have much chance of influencing the terms of living together in such basic fundamental matters as controlling pandemics, providing collective security, avoiding systemic risk in financial system, systems, or fighting climate change. Second though, collective oversight by elected national governments cannot be enough for democratic control of union policies and laws aimed at managing externalities between member state democracies. Collective oversight, collective supervision by national governments, national executives, risks executive domination to the exclusion of public debate and parliamentary supervision. What needs democratic control and legitimacy is not just the union itself, but the entire structure of power relations created by the union. That includes the huge empowerment of national governments, national executives, through their everyday participation in the exercise of the union's powers and the making of its laws. The participation of governments in union decisions is a part of what needs to be democratically controlled and not just a possible contribution to democratic control. Yet third, it cannot even be enough, it cannot even be enough to embed democratic control of union decisions aimed at managing externalities in the wider democratic institutions and democratic politics of each member state. Thoroughly desirable, though it might otherwise be to empower and involve national parliaments and national publics in union decisions. Here's the problem, here's the problem. If any one national democracy has an interest in imposing harmful negative externalities on its neighbours or in free riding on the efforts of other countries to provide positive externalities in ecology, economy or security, then its own electorate and its own parliament will have a similar interest. National democracies may then need to be able to bind themselves, to bind themselves to rules and institutions at the European Union level if they are to manage externalities between themselves in ways needed to meet their own most basic obligations to their own publics to secure rights, justice, non-domination and democracy. That, it seems to me, is a compelling challenge for the future of Europe to identify, how to identify, how to identify forms of representation at the European level that are justified and defined by the obligations member state democracies owe to their own publics as determined by the procedures of public control with political equality in each of those member state democracies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christopher. That uh, was clear and did not mince any words as we expected and hoped for. And I think it spoke really well to uh, at least two themes that have popped up already. So the idea of externalities and the unions functioning in, in, in reducing these or managing these, as well as the issue of executive dominance, even if maybe you don't agree with previous proposals as to how to address that. 
Um, wonderful. I just want to, before we move on to our next speaker, I just want to remind the audience that you can post your questions at all times in the Q&A. You don't have to worry that this disturbs the speakers because they won't see it. It is uh, Olivier who, who handles that. So um, we have not received any questions yet. While I am convinced there are many out there, so please uh, don't uh, shy away from, from posting them already now. Okay, so now we move on to Michael Keating. Yes, thank you very much. I would like to share also my screen. If I could get the authorization, that would be really, really nice. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Okay. You should be seeing now the PowerPoint presentation, right? Well, thank you very much, Sasha, for the nice introductory words. And uh, well, the conference has shown the conference on the and around the future of Europe that it cannot be the future without forms of differentiation. And it cannot be, um, and this is my input here, without actually thinking and talking also about EU agencies. And I'm very happy um, uh, to, to be able to sit on this panel to elaborate a little bit very quickly on ongoing research and thoughts uh, very much linked to ongoing research elsewhere, such as Tarn and Maastricht um, and the recent publications, uh, which I will be referring to um, during my presentation here. What we have seen in the European Union, and I think you would all agree, is a mushrooming of EU agencies. Point taken. Fine. It's spread all over the European Union. Fine. What is quite striking, though, is that we also start considering EU agencies more and more as solutions to European problems. Whenever there is a problem that needs to be fixed, very often at the very end, we see either new agencies emerging or existing agencies growing in power. And that has led over the last decades, as we all know, to very different types of agencies with very different powers, also budgetary powers, levels of independence, and so on and so forth. I will not go into this. There is a rich literature out there on this specific aspect and also related to the different forms of governance. Now, with regard to the different forms of governance, though, there has been little. There has been, but there has been little um, actually research on the growing involvement and importance of third countries on these EU agencies. Because to start off with empirically, there are no real fixed legally binding rules, uniform rules at least concerning the involvement of uh, third countries in EU agencies. And this has led nevertheless uh, to a situation that we do have a whole set of EU agencies. We have more than 40 agencies now, um, roughly, um, yeah, you could say uh, 34 of them regulatory agencies, if you follow the EU's um, 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 labeling accordingly. But what is quite striking is that research um, has slowly, uh, but more and more vividly over the last couple of years now, actually started looking into the role of third countries in EU agencies. And you see the references of a selected set of uh, research. And more importantly, and that is also quite important, the respective role of EU agencies and their policies in the respective third countries. Now, this is important to further look into because whenever we talk about the future of Europe, I think EU agencies will play potentially a central role. Um, and that is linked also to um, many topics we have been listening to throughout the conference and also on this panel here, uh, that there is not much appetite uh, for, let's say, new rounds of enlargement or anything alike. So we have to look to, 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 for alternatives. And one of these alternatives might very much be a, a more systematic, a more strategic maybe, and a more explicit uh, use of third countries' involvement in agencies um, in, in order to define and maybe redefine or reinforce uh, the future relations with, for example, Western Balkan countries, Turkey, or as a matter of fact, now also uh, with the UK. 
And this is theoretically, conceptually, as you all know, very closely linked to uh, the forms of external differentiation, huh? understood as rules and policies that apply to some, but not to all third countries. And this is pretty much where I would like to, to, to get into. And that links me to the basic uh, question uh, that I intend to, to to look into and particularly that is whether and in which policy areas and then under what conditions third countries more systematic involved uh, involvement in new agencies uh, could be used as a renewed form of external differentiation focusing on the one hand as I said and as ex existing literature has started to look into the impact of the work of you um, of EU agencies of by third countries but also the impacting of, thought, um, of, of um, policies of third countries. And here are, as you know, and this links also to Sasha's introduction or introductory note um, around my contribution, that there are two standing um, um, arguments in the literature. A lot of uh, researchers come back to systematically, and that is the classical division between a foreign policy objectives kind of a concept where you would identify cooperation between agencies and third countries following a pattern of the third country's integration status with the European Union. And that would focus or that would come down to the argument, the deeper the key based cooperation between the European Union and the third country, the greater the incentive to participate on both sides uh, in the agency, or you would have as uh, explained in the literature, a more functional logic, the, a logic more of a sector specific interdependence, arguing that cooperation between EU agencies and the third country follows the pattern of sector specific interdependence. So here the focus um, less on a foreign policy tool, not a top down kind of approach, but more a bottom up where externalities matter. Uh, externalities of non-cooperation, policies failures affecting the situation in EU member states and choices of one party uh, inside the European Union or outside the European Union affecting the choices of the other party inside the European Union or outside the European Union. And this is um, what um, uh, I think uh, would be an extremely um, um, important uh, contribution in the overall discussion around the future of Europe, basically linking to existing research that has been carried out ar around the role of EFTA and EAA and European neighbourhood um, partnership countries um, to a specific country I'm particularly interested in because uh, the future relationship with Turkey will be key, will be important will be pivotal for a number of reasons i will not go into detail here i think this is very much um, present to all of us considering the current situations uh, not only in the eastern mediterranean um, and this has been uh, carried out for um, third countries but leaving out turkey and i would like to jump in here and basically use um, uh, the question of um, uh, representation and management boards, um, um, because for the time being, Turkey is in fact actually has an observer status in two agencies, in the Environment Agency and the European Monitoring Drug uh, Trafficking um, Agency in Lisbon. So there are already agencies with Turkish um, um, observer status and civil servants regularly joining the meetings. Um, but there is very little knowledge of how this actually came about and why only these agencies and why not other agencies. Uh, and this is where I would like to delve further into because existing research on the European neighborhood partners or the EAA and AFTER have also uh, looked into different types of working arrangements such as ad hoc arrangements uh, or special bilateral arrangements. So specific forms of working arrangements where you could have a better understanding memorandums of understanding, for example, uh, being established with um, agencies um, and Turkey. So in the end, what I would like um, uh, in the long run then to contribute uh, in the differentiation debate uh, around external differentiation and the future of Europe is, first of all, 
linking to the growing um, literature on the importance of EU agencies and the third parties involvement in those agencies, mapping um, um, a comparative overview um, and explaining the Turkey's current situation and potential future situation in EU agencies, because I think because existing research has found that in the for all the other countries, uh, the argument that um, um, actually uh, interdependence of policy areas matters much more than the foreign policy kind of logic, that this could further um, help um, um, also the EU's approach to redefine or to uh, refocus its policy vis-a-vis -vis Turkey uh, by basically assessing and exploring uh, the potential of Turkey's involvement uh, as a third country in different forms of memberships and different forms of working arrangements, learning from uh, the EFTA, the EA, uh, the European neighborhood parties uh, in the wrong run, um, so that in the end we could see um, uh, external differentiation as a successful a form of future cooperation between EU and Turkey, a relationship driven by a more functionalist logic, by a bottom-up logic of sector-specific interdependence. Thank you very much, Sasha. Well, thank you, Michael, for addressing something that honestly I'd never really considered before. Uh, this is extremely interesting. Uh, it does raise for me, I don't know, maybe for the audience, for the panelists as well, some some questions about legitimacy of all of this. But um, uh, I'm sure we will address that in uh, the in the discussions. Um, I will as now. I said, there has been research before, but my focus would be particularly on Turkey. As yes. A, yes. Thank you. Very, very good. Um, I will now move to the uh, final speaker, uh, final paper giver of uh, of this session, and uh, that is Richard Crow. Richard, are you there? Yes, can you hear me, Sasha? You are there, yes, I can have you on my screen now, good. Okay. <laughs> can you hear me also, I hope? Yes. Okay, thank you, Sasha. So I'm going to talk a bit about the, um, the situation with the EU budget. And first of all, I'll talk a bit about the current situation and then make some or discuss some possible recommendations for the future. Now, 2020 was really a landmark year for the EU budget. And I think it brings us to a critical juncture. Um, we can remember the Lacken Declaration and the famous opening words that Europe is at a crossroads. I think Europe always seems to be at a crossroads, but um, certainly in the budgetary domain, I think we're coming to a very important moment. Now, why was 2020 significant? Well, I think it was mentioned in the opening uh, yesterday morning by Sasha that I said the recovery plan was a Hamiltonian moment. Um, I should stress I didn't say that. I said that the some people have said that it's a it's a Hamiltonian moment, and especially in the media, um, this term was frequently used. Um, of course, it's it's quite exaggerated. We're not talking here about mutualizing the debts of the member states, but nevertheless, what happened uh, is significant, and. Um, the term Hamiltonian, it's, it is a good point of reference to start a discussion, and of course it, it does attract attention, which is not always easy when you're talking about the EU budget. So what was the real significance of what happened last year? Well, in my view, the significance is that for the first time since 1988, we see some movement. The fundamental structure of the EU budget has really remained frozen since 1988. What happened in 1988? We had the Delors One package of reforms, um, which on the expenditure side introduced the MFF, the multi-annual planning. Um, because we had so many annual budgetary crises in the 80s, it was decided we need some sort of long-term planning. Uh, on the revenue side, it introduced the GNI resource. So the traditional loan resources, customs duties, and so on were insufficient to cover expenditure. Therefore, we needed this GNI resource, essentially a national contribution from the member states, to make up the shortfall. Now, what's happened since then? Well, on the expenditure side in 1988, the tradition developed that the expenditure is fixed at about 1% of EU GNI. And that's remained more or less the same up to now. Um, about 80% of the budget back then was pre-allocated in cohesion and in agriculture to the member states. So every seven years, we have this massive negotiation. 
The member states fixed the size of the budget for the seven years at about 1% of EU GNI, and about 80% of it is pre-allocated to member states and cannot be changed thereafter. Um, in the next MFF, the pre-allocation is reduced to about two thirds in cohesion and agriculture, but still very significant. And then on the revenue side, what's happened is that over the decades, the share of revenue taken up by the GNI resource has increased, and it's now over 70% of EU budget revenue. Um, what does this mean? Well, on the positive side, it gives us a stable budget. It gives us the assurance that there will be own resources. This is essential for the EU's AAA rating, and we will always need the GNI resource as a residual resource. But the downsides, I think, are, are well known. It leads to this focus on net balances on national juice retour. So each country in the seven year negotiation is calculating how much do we pay in? How much will we get back from the EU budget? And they set their red lines accordingly. And this has been the way really all the time since 1988. It leads to this zero sum game where every euro contributed to the EU budget is perceived to be a loss from the national side. And of course, this was taken to extremes in the UK, which really had the, the most transactional approach to the EU budget. Um, also, because of the pre-programming, the MFF is very, very rigid. And this means that during the course of a programming period, if circumstances change, it's very hard to adapt. So really, I think if we were giving this presentation two years ago, there was a very nice publication by a German academic, uh, Peter Becker, who said that the EU budget is lost in stagnation. And that's how it seemed. Which doesn't mean that nothing was happening in Europe's public finances, because, of course, especially in the last decade, what we have seen is what in the European Parliament uh, is sometimes referred to as this galaxy of funds and instruments around the EU budget, but at European level. And most especially, we saw this in the uh, during the financial crisis, the EFSF, the ESM and so on. Uh, during the migration crisis, we saw this refugee facility for Turkey. Um, largely financed outside the MFF intergovernmentally, simply because the MFF was too rigid. And to change the MFF, you need unanimity, it's too difficult. So there was a tendency to do things more um, outside the framework of the EU budget, but at European level. And I think that's the important point. By force of necessity, it was necessary to do more at European level in the domain of public finance, but the EU budget and the legal framework governing the EU budget was essentially too rigid to accommodate what needed to be done. So what happened in 2020? Well, first of all, we had a deal on a new MFF, which to a large extent continues in the tradition of previous MFFs. It's fixed at about 1.12% of EU GNI. Uh, there are some new what would be called modernizing elements like funding for the Green Deal for new policies, uh, digital transition and so on. But to a large extent, it follows the, the previous pattern. But now we have this new element, something temporary and exceptional, the next generation EU, the recovery plan. I won't explain the details. I think everybody is familiar with it, 750 billion euro. A large part of that will be borrowed and passed on to member states as back-to-back -back lending, which is nothing new. It's been done before in the EFSM, the balance of payments facility and so on. But really the new innovative element is this borrowing to finance grants. So essentially the EU on a temporary exceptional basis on the basis of Article 122 of the treaty, borrowing to finance non-reimbursable grants to finance operational expenditure. Now, why is this significant? And I say it's significant because it has positives, it has raises opportunities, but it also raises risks. On the positive side, I think that after a decade of austerity and really a lot of negativity, in, in the notion of EU budgetary law, both in terms of the EU budget, but also EU constraints on national budgets, I think this is an opportunity to change the narrative, to speak of an EU budget founded on solidarity between states and citizens and coordinated action at national and European level. And particularly, I think, following the Vice case, the announcement of NGEU, it really provided a nice reassurance that Germany remains committed to European integration and remains committed to solidarity. Also of significance is the unity of the EU budget, because we have this trend of more and more being done outside the EU budget intergovernmentally. And back in April, I remember a very lively <laughs> at the Parliament where um, President Sassoli, who spoke yesterday, 
really insisted very strongly to the Commission, do not propose something intergovernmental. You have to do this within the EU framework. And some member states, including very large and significant member states, wanted to set up a special purpose vehicle like the EFSF. And I think we can credit the Commission and credit the ingenuity of the Commission's lawyers that they did manage to um, propose something on a, within the Union legal framework, and that's very significant. Um, also, the Recovery and Resilience Facility involves all member states. Uh, before 2020, we were looking at a BIC, a Eurozone instrument which would be financed by intergovernmentally by the Eurozone member states. So here again, um, maybe something in the direction of unity. Something that hasn't been much noticed is that the European Development Fund, which used to exist outside the EU budget, uh, again, financed intergovernmentally, will be incorporated into the budget as part of the new MFF deal. So in terms of unity, I think we have some very nice developments. And of course, legally, this means that everything is within the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. Risks, um, the economic impact. I mean, the expectations are high now. There's, there's an expectation of a European recovery plan and it must deliver. Uh, it hasn't yet been ratified by the national parliaments. The adoption period is very, very short, 21 to 23, sorry, the implementation period, when the funds must be committed. Uh, will member states be able to absorb the funds in that period? Um, and will they propose good plans and use, use the money uh, wisely? Also, from the perspective of budgetary control, I think there is a big danger that in, in investing so much money in such a short period of time, there is a, a, a risk of waste. Um, we have the rule of law issue. I think if it goes wrong in that respect, this will be very damaging. Um, also, a very big danger is the repayments. If the EU budget is going to be fixed, will remain fixed at 1% of EU GNI, will the repayments over time start to crowd out the ordinary expenditure on things like agriculture and um, cohesion? So I think this could raise a risk of big, big uh, problems politically also in the future, unless the momentum for reform is maintained. And finally, on EMU, we have lots of ideas that were proposed in 2017 by the Commission, the St. Nicholas package, with the idea of a European finance minister incorporating the ESM and all that. These are all big leaps. And I think with NGEU, we're making a big leap. And this big leap has to work, because if it works, it may provide momentum for further big leaps. If it doesn't, it could set everything backwards. So finally, I'm just at my limit, but I'll finish on some recommendations. First of all, I think we have the short to medium term. We need to maintain momentum. That means the successful implementation of NGEU. Also, very significantly, the Member States and the Parliament and the Commission recognise this issue of repayments and danger for the future. And therefore, they have laid down in an interinstitutional agreement a roadmap for the introduction of new own resources. Um, and the Commission will come forward with proposals already this summer for own resources related to a, a um, carbon border adjustment mechanism, the ETS, uh, and a digital levy, with more to follow. And I think it's very important that we maintain the political momentum to get new own resources, not just symbolic ones. We do have a new one linked to plastic waste, which is just being introduced, which is quite modest and quite symbolically important. But we need a big one. We need one that will bring tens of billions per year to the budget. And I think that will again be a big leap that will require political leadership uh, to bring it about. And finally, regarding the longer term, maybe issues that could be considered in the conference, I would say the withdrawal of the UK, um, of course, it brings very bad things and it's a, it leaves a shortfall in the budget. But it does remove the, the member state that most vociferously contested the legitimacy of the EU budget, the very fact that we have an EU budget. I think most of the other member states, and even here in the Parliament, even talking to quite Eurosceptic groups, they acknowledge there are things we need to do together at European level. And so I think it would be good to pull back and think in a more holistic way, look at the EU budget, the national budgets, the intergovernmental mechanisms in a single frame from the perspective of the citizen taxpayers and say, OK, what should we be doing at the different levels? And what is really best done at European level. And if we're to do it at European level, we get also give the resources to finance it. And I think here of the agencies, where often there's a tendency to create new agencies and then not provide the funding to go with it. And finally, citizens. Um, it's said that the union is a union of states and citizens. Um, in the legal order, of course, we all know that the treaties were initially seen as treaties between states. And then the court in Van Gendenloos said, no, these treaties are special. They give rights and obligations to citizens. 
What about the budget? Well, essentially, the introduction of the own resources system went hand in hand with giving further powers to the European Parliament over the budget. And in the 70s, that was the vision that citizens would be involved both in terms of the own resources and how the budget is controlled. But when it came to these multi-annual negotiations, the seven-year MFFs, there we increasingly see that this is a budget between states. There is a big negotiation in the European Council. It is essentially intergovernmental haggling, fixing the envelopes for the seven years. And then at the end, the parliament comes along and tries to improve it in some minor ways. So what can we do? I think one thing to maybe consider is how can we better align the MFF cycle with the institutional cycle and with the European elections? Because what happens nowadays, we have a seven year MFF, which is not aligned with the five year institutional cycle. And we saw this with Jean-Claude Juncker when he became president in 2014. He became president of the commission and was bound by an MFF that had been adopted in December 2013 and runs up until 2020. And his first initiative, he said, I want to establish an investment plan. And the member states said, that's lovely. Yes, please go ahead. And then he said, but I need resources. And they said, no, you can't have any. You, you have the MFF. And so the MFF actually had to be amended to lower the funding for Horizon 2020 and for um, Connecting Europe facility to make the space for this uh, investment plan. So I think ideally we would have European elections where the MFF proposals are on the table, the political parties at European level present their mandates to the people. And afterwards, after the elections, the parliament then adopts its interim report where it sets out the conditions under which it will grant consent to the MFF at the European Council. And so I think we have to think a bit about how can we align the MFF and the electoral cycle better so that the budget and the policies go together in terms of the um, discussion. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, Richard. Uh, those are very sensible recommendations there. And uh, thank you also for reporting a bit on a success story, I think, of uh, the community method prevailing uh, once more. Very pleased to hear that. And your comment on the relevance that all of this now happens without the UK is, of course, one that is not only relevant for the budget. I think something playing in the background of this entire conference, isn't it? Like, in a way, this is an exercise of all of us thinking, so what can we do now, uh, now that some particular actor is no longer in the room holding us back potentially. Okay, so um, we will now move on to the panel discussion. Once again, I'd like to remind the audience they can post their questions in the Q&A. Um, but first, we will give the floor to all our panelists to react to some of the things that have been said, shine their lights on these themes. Um, very happy that uh, Paul Magnette was able to join us after some initial connection issues, I, I think, but uh, you are here now, so welcome, and uh, I immediately pass the floor to you. Thank you very thank you. much, and thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be uh, in this panel and to listen to the very provocative and uh, very interesting presentations. I try to I use my clock and make sure I will stick to my five minutes and make a few comments on the issue of democratic legitimacy. Because this issue always comes back each time we open a new debate about the future of Europe, about uh, uh, reforming Europe, the question of general and democratic legitimacy more specifically, systematically comes back and there's a huge literature about that. So this has to be taken uh, seriously. First, two caveats. First, if we look at the EU from a formal point of view, if we look at the EU institutional system, uh, as it is described, the process and the decision making process, as it is described by, by the treaties, the EU has become a democratic system. I mean, to be honest, if we compare the EU to other federal systems, we cannot say that the democratic deficit that Dave, David Markin in the 1970s, or really more than 40 years ago, uh, described and criticized is still there. I mean, the, the, there were huge change in terms of uh, the powers of the European Parliament, transparency and many other things. And we can say that the EU is formally uh, uh, democratic and transparent. Second, most of the problems that we that we focus on in terms of democratic legitimacy would also exist if there were no EU. The points were perfectly described by my good uh, friend and colleague Christopher Lord. The question of externalities of free riding would be there and would even be harsher in the absence of the EU. We in Belgium, for example, 
cannot say that we've lost monetary sovereignty with the euro. We had no monetary sovereignty before the euro. We were 100% dependent on the decisions of the Bundesbank in Germany. And so with the euro, with the sharing of sovereignty, we have more sovereignty than in the past. So the same with, with the fiscal competition, for example. I am the first to regret that there's so many fiscal competition between the EU, within the EU, but fiscal competition between Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg is a history which has lasted for more than a century now, and it would be uh, stronger within the EU than it is with the EU. So this has to be kept in mind. But nevertheless, the perception that the EU is not democratic remains very strong among citizens, and this perception needs to be taken seriously. What can we do? I think two different kinds of things. First, there are things that we should think about which do not require trade exchange, things that we can improve without trade exchange. For example, we have a directly elected parliament, we have, a, as we know, the Spitzenkandidat mechanism, the selection of the commission, and so on and so forth. This is enough on paper to transform progressively the EU into a real parliamentary mechanism. And I'm pretty sure that with the past time, each time we use those mechanisms, we make those mechanisms stronger. Each time we, we respect the choice of the EP and the EP itself respects uh, the results, the member states have to respect it. And it will maybe will maybe take 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, but in the end, the mechanism will become very strong. The same with the citizen initiative. Although I think we should look more uh, in detail, not at the citizen initiative as such, uh, can generate lots of transnational mobilization in the EU. It can open the agenda of the EU, but the Commission must then take more uh, and, and European Commission and those citizens' initiatives, but without necessary trade change. Yet we do also do need trade change, I think. Our input, province of input legitimacy and legitimacy process. The process and the policies and, and the policies themselves is all, all, always very difficult to make. Nevertheless, I, I've always thought and I keep thinking that the EU as it exists today, one of the major flaws of the EU is the fact that the this making process as it exists today favors some kinds of policies policies other it is competition and competition than fiscal coordination and social coordination and this is a problem a constitution should be neutral it should not be in favor of one set of policies against another one uh, last comment uh, one of the major reasons why the the uh, democratic legitimacy is perceived as a, as a, as not enough that, that that people think that there's a problem of democratic legitimacy is certainly the fact that most of the competencies as, are, as we know, mixed competencies, and that the subdivision of power between the EU and the member states is very often very, very complicated. My five minutes are over, so I go very close to, to the end. Uh, it's very often complicated, and that this generates lots of, of problems of, uh, of uh, legitimacy. I give an example. The recommendations of the European Commission in the framework of the European semester. One, I mean, the way the European Commission uses this instrument of recommendation is key in terms of legitimacy. We had commissioners who, Belgium, for example, when I was a federal minister, who told Belgium, you have to revise the pension this way, you have to revise the wage mechanism uh, this way, and so forth and so forth. Although those were, had nothing to do with European I mean, And this was really a negation of the, the spirit of directives and indirect government. That thing. I think that the mixed assembly, as the one others in the European Union, should be looked at uh, very closely and seriously. I was initially very skeptical about that idea, but when I look, Paul, can play on the distinction between national arenas and European arenas, but this, this has been a problem from the start, but also how complicated it can be to delineate the competence of the EU and the competence of the member states and you'd go. I think that a sound and, and fair discussion between 
European MPs and national MPs two or three times a year on those issues could help uh, improve the mechanism of decision making process and avoid a lot of this uh, legitimacy. Uh, Thank you, Paul. Despite some connection issues, I think you are such a compelling speaker that we managed to nevertheless understand everything you were saying, even though there were frequent interruptions. Uh, otherwise, people can, of course, always ask for further clarifications. Um, we move on to Maria Jose. Please, uh, your microphone. Or otherwise, maybe IT can. Yes, I can. Ah, no. Now is now is perfect. Just a moment. Okay. So thank you, Sasha. I was saying, and thank you everybody for those excellent uh, presentation. And in fact, I think we we could understand uh, very well Paul in any case what what you said, which, which I agree completely, especially about democracy in the union. Well. I thank you especially, Richard. I'm coming back to the to Richard presentation, and it's not because it's not out of corporatism because we both of us we come from the legal service of the European Parliament, but because uh, he had this uh, very positive approach, optimistic, this Hamiltonian even approach, and um, I think also with you that uh, the European Union has just achieved to face the consequences of the pandemic. In, in, what what we have been able to do is a qualitative progress. I'm also happy with the accent you put in the flexibility of the treaties to allow for experiments, not originally foreseen, like the new Jordanism package, and also on the mechanism of the Treaty of Lisbon that enabled the Union to modify itself without the heavy revision procedure. In fact, my comment on this part of the conference is a praise for the Treaty of Lisbon. And that's for two reasons. The first is the capacity, the capacity of that treaty for self-modification. The constitutional treaty on which the Lisbon Treaty is based was conceived, um, paradoxically, with the intention of lasting. That is why the treaty provides for numerous clauses amending the union primary law without recourse to the ordinary revision procedure with an intergovernmental conference with subsequent national ratification. Most of these clauses, in fact, serve the objective of deeper integration and especially of more democratization. Uh, clauses like the simplified form uh, reforms of the treaty, the procedural bridges in so many legal bases, the legal bases for institutional decision like composition of the parliament, composition of the commission, presidency of the council, statute of the court of justice, of the central bank, electoral law, etc. The different kinds of enhanced cooperation structure or to finish with the bindings interinstitutional agreements. 12 years after the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty, in fact, those clauses have never been used. So maybe the question of uh, reform of not reform of the treaties is not so relevant at that moment. Uh, you need more political strength to modify the treaties and to apply provisions the treaty through secondary law for which clearly there is political will, there is not, sorry, political will from the member states. So, so it's a, I think it's a little bit not too useful to, to discuss about treaty changes or not. My second praise of the Lisbon Treaty concerned the rationalization of the legal order of the union it tried to achieve. Of course, and the excellent presentation of Professor Tark highlighted it, this rationalization is very limited. Is limited because something as essential to the union as the conferral principle. And because the treaties decline this, this principle of conferral into precise legal bases isolated from each other. So, furthermore, each of the legal bases reflects a particular political sensitiveness which determines 
a case by case approach to the delimitation of competence of the union and to the procedures. So the classification on legislative, non legislative, ordinary uh, procedure, a special legislative act, etc., is an attempt to introduce a classification as some logic into this forest of legal basis. It's nothing more than that. It is true that the attempt is not fully successful, uh, but at, uh, at the end of the day, it has been very useful, for instance, to extend very much the decision. Uh, and because of the most decisive feature of the union legal order is the principle of conferral and, and those sealed legal bases, you can only apply principles, general principles as hierarchy of norm in a very imperfect way. So is what happens with delegated and implementing act. They reflect the distinction the treaty established for the first time between the legislative and the executive power, which for me is an important evolution of the of the union legal 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 order. Delegated acts are part of the legislative scope. The legislature delegates its own power and submitted to conditions. Doing that, it delimitates the boundaries of what is legislative. Implementing acts, on the other hand, belongs to the scope of the executive power that in the union belongs to the member states. So only when homogeneous conditions are set in Article 191 are needed, the Commission is in charge of this task. And that is logic that is submit it's a kind of, of delegation from the member states, could, could be said like that. And this is the reason why it submit to the control of committees of national experts. I understand perfectly well that the court is not going too deeply into that, because at the end of the day, it's up to the legislature, to the two legislators of the union, to decide. It's a political decision, especially. So the reasons for the interinstitutional uh, fight about that, that are very, very long to explain, and it's not for this moment. And I think I'm, I'm, I'm already go beyond my five minutes. Thank you very much, Sasha. Thank you, and for indeed reminding us of the many ways in which we can change the treaty without changing the treaty, which is, of course, one of the big issues that the German Constitutional Court had with uh, the Lisbon Treaty. That's OK. Um, so now uh, I ask Ellen Voss to take the floor, please. OK, thank you very much, uh, Sasha. Thank you. Uh very much for this nice discussion and being here. I would like to uh, share with you four observations uh, for further discussions. My first point relates a bit to also what uh, Maria Jose already mentioned is um, the criteria of uh, the 219, 291. And Alexander, I think, points really rightly out that is rather doubtful that meaningful criteria can be found or developed that distinguish between the supplementing or amending of Article 290 and implementing of Article 291. Here, I would also like to add that in practice, the Commission has been constrained by the Council in consulting so-called national experts before it adopts the delegated acts. So these national experts, actually, who appear in practice to be the same persons as the national representatives who sit in comitology committees. So in the morning, with the head of national experts in delegated acts, and the afternoon, they sit on with the head of the National Representative Comitology com Committees within the context of implementing acts. So seen in this light, also very pragmatically also, one can even doubt whether delegated acts can be truly seen as centralized rulemaking that grants commission, the Commission of Autonomous Regulatory Space to adopt quasi-legislative norms. And in this way, it has also it has often been uh, argued in the literature that the Commission prefers delegated acts over implementing acts. Recent empirical research by one of my uh, PhD researchers, uh, Zamira uh, Safari, who uh, defended her PhD, partly confirms it. This, however, this research importantly reveals that in some instances, it says the Commission not only prefers implementing acts over delegated acts but even at times insist on resorting to implementing acts instead of having delegated acts. 
such findings uh, in the field of food and health not only call for more empirical research in, in other policy areas, but also, in my view, would seem to plead for a more general reflection on the need to distinguish between delegate and implementing acts, and whether this twofold system should not be replaced by one system for delegation with a revised comatology and a strong role for the European Parliament. And this already, I argued actually, I pleaded for uh, when uh, this system was proposed in the, uh, in the uh, former constitutional treaty. So in this way, I'm not so happy as Marie Jose with the Lisbon Treaty. And I would even say that uh, the drawing a clear line between normative space and non-legislative rulemaking by the European Commission does not only do, be uh, to be proof, uh, proven to be difficult in practice, but is even not desirable from a perspective of legitimate rulemaking. So future treaty revision merging 290 and 291 would be desirable, but of course um, that uh, is a rather uh, maybe not very feasible in the future that we would have a treaty revision. Uh, uh, revision. My second observation relates to the other normative space that Alexander mentions, namely rulemaking by European agencies that is not even taken into account in the current system of delegate and implementing act as laid down in the treaty. This constitutional neglect has been repaired by, as Alexander rightly observes, by the European Court in the ESMA, but would surely also be needed to address in a treaty revision, but of course, with the remark that I just made that it might not be um, very likely to occur in the near future. The questions that need to be addressed here is also in, in view of the fact that uh, these agencies set important norms is whether we want even agencies to be delegate more powers at the expense of the European Commission. And do we want them to independently set norms? In this kind of discussion is interesting to observe that the Commission, often seen as a technocratic institution, is depicted more as a policymaker and even at times even the political actor, whilst agencies are considered as the technocrats. And uh, as um, uh, Michael Keating also observed rightly, agencies are often presented as solution, but maybe now are uh, seen also as problems themselves in terms of legitimacy. Um, so in how far can or should Maroni 2.0, as established by ESMA, be further loosened. In all likelihood, the answers to these questions may be different for policy, various policy areas. And I think it will be, make a difference when we talk about the role of EMMA, the European Medicines Agency, as we saw now also in current COVID crisis, as regards its medicines, or for example, the EFSA, as regards food. My first two observations then lead to my third observation I would like to make. Namely, the question of whether we should further enhance legitimacy of the normative spaces. The rule my, making by the European Commission and other actors such as comatology and European agencies. I would like to emphasize the need to increase stakeholder involvement uh, in rule making by the European Commission and by agencies. Back in 2007, and I looked it up still, I had some notes in fact still that Robert Madeline then Director uh, General of DG Sanko already had developed the idea as a part of the healthy democracy that he developed for DG Sanko initiative to classify comatology measures in categories and to match these categories with different methods of uh, stakeholder involvement and to organize specific meetings between the chairs of comatology committee and the advisory group on the animal food, uh, what it was called then, the animal food chain and plant health committee, uh, 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 group, in fact, that co was composed of uh, representatives uh, of NGOs, etc. This initiative has not been continued, yet today as part of the better regulation agenda, citizens and other stakeholders can provide feedback on the draft of an implementing act for four weeks before the relevant committee votes to accept or reject it. I must myself say that I'm not aware of uh, whether this happens and uh, how this occurs in practice. So I would say that there would be some need for research here, but it's always a good thing for researchers. 
And I would, in any case, like to underline that there is here space for improvement and reflection about the proper, appropriate way of stakeholder involvement in this uh, normative space. The European Parliament's resolution of last December on the comitology proposal to amend the 2012 comitology regulation expresses, yes, the need for, uh, for improved citizens' awareness of the procedure, but is completely silent on whether these um, stakeholders or citizens should be further in involved in uh, comatology procedures. I think that here there would be an urgent need to drastically modify the comatology regulation and take account of this, in particular also of this aspect, and matter of many other aspects that I will not discuss now here. I think also it's very important to reflect and to model stakeholder involvement, not only for implementing, but also for delegated acts. I further also would like to underline the need for stakeholder involvement in relation not only to rulemaking, but also science making by agencies. By now, there are already several uh, models of stakeholder and citizens involvement in rule and or science making uh, by agencies. And probably there would not um, need to be to have a one size fits all approach, but there is a need, in fact, to 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 reflect on that and to maybe to to group uh, various agencies and the need for and to conceptualize the need for a kind of stakeholder involvement. I would also underline the need to conceptualize the, the relation between agencies and the member states, um, because agencies, yes, are accountable to um, the various institutions, but what about the member states and especially the hybrid nature of agencies with member states in their governing board requires, I would say, uh, the um, need to reflect, uh, re requires the reflection of what the role of agencies would be. Maybe agencies as in-betweeners, as Michelle Everson and I have called it already before, between the institutions and the member states. So I entirely agree with Alexander that there should be a much also more formal control on the rulemaking and, um, and how we should, uh, should control and not leave it to uh, well, what he even mentioned as uh, a chats uh, 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 among uh, people uh, uh, over a coffee or something, or maybe now even over a Zoom, probably a Zoom session. So my four, fourth and last observation is very short and links to the presentation of Michael. I subscribe to his arguments and yes, we have in fact developed this uh, also further in the TARN uh, network, but I could even uh, go uh, further and would argue that maybe parts, uh, that participation of third countries in EU agencies may also be proof uh, an alternative for EU membership. I would like here to point out to the research project by Marco Milenkovic who is doing research on the participation of Western Balkans in EU agencies as perhaps an alternative to future EU membership. So maybe that's, I don't know if, if you, Michael, uh, are also considering this element to study that, that in your project on Turkey, but uh, I would be happy to uh, bring in contact also with, uh, with Michael, uh, with, uh, sorry, with Marco. <laughs> okay, I stop here, thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen, for your signature capacity to provide clarity and insight into such a complex area, uh, which now seems to everyone so clear. Um, thank you very much. And that leads me to introduce to you the final panel member, which is, of course, one of our very own students. Uh, it is Frédéric, you have the floor. Good afternoon, and thank you very much, Professor Garben, for uh, giving me this opportunity to discuss all those important questions. I would also like to express my gratitude towards the authors of all those fascinating papers, uh, towards the other panelists for their excellent remarks, and uh, finally, towards my colleagues who chose me to represent them at uh, this conference and who expressed their views in a survey on which I based my intervention. So, uh, what do young Europeans think? Well, first of all, it is difficult not to agree with Professor Lord that the EU decision-making process obviously needs to be further democratized. This is apparently what almost all of my fellow colleagues think. In his paper, uh, Professor Lord quotes Immanuel Kant uh, in order to underline that in a genuine democracy, um, citizens have to control the authoring, amendment, 
and administration of all the laws. And we all know that the European Parliament constitutes the only EU institution whose members are directly elected by the citizens. It should therefore not come as a surprise to you if I tell you that about 70% of us support the idea of breaking the Commission's quasi-monopoly of legislative initiative to the benefit of the Parliament. I also recognize that half of the students uh, would like to see the ordinary legislative procedure extended even further. Uh, the latter is particularly important as, according to Professor Turk, it combines the uh, ideals of democracy, the rule of law and federalism, all of which are difficult to combine and at the same time declining throughout the whole European Union. Uh, Professor Turk accurately points out that while those limitations to the EU uh, legislative processes persist, the Union decision-making also relies in part on uh, delegated and implementing acts, which constitute non-legislative, centralized methods of lawmaking. Uh, there is therefore still large space for improvement and democratization of the EU lawmaking processes. Uh, similarly, I agree with a great number of my colleagues who would not definitely abandon the Spitzenkandidaten principle, nor the introduction of transnational lists in European parliamentary elections. Uh, the appointment of the head of the European Commission, uh, which was contrary to the Parliament's will, and the rejection of the proposal of transnational lists by most of the MEPs, show, however, that uh, those innovative ideas for a further democratization of the Union are simply not adapted to its present nature. For such ideas to be implemented, I think we will first have to establish a common European public sphere. So as much as I agree that it would be unrealistic to suppose that an ordinary Spaniard knows well candidates from, let's say, Finland, instead of simply stating that th this could never be possible, uh, we should think of various ways of bringing the EU closer to its citizens. I'm referring a bit to the previous panel, but to say that the recent reform of the European Citizens' Initiative seems to be a good, although largely insufficient, step in this direction. And why insufficient? Uh, the truth is, most people in Europe do not really know what the European Union stands for and are not necessarily interested in it. And why would they be if it is so abstract to them, so absent from all national media? For instance, you would be surprised how ridiculously little attention French television paid to the Polish-Hungarian veto of the multi-annual financial framework, which actually risked undermining 70 years of European integration. This is simply unacceptable. If you want to democratize the EU, it is of course important to agree on how to reform its institutional framework. But no matter how, the future, how smart the future reforms will be, um, those who influence public opinion, the media, I think they also bear a large part of responsibility in this matter. Thus, instead of complaining about the still disappointing turnout in EP elections, and uh, we should instead think of how we inform citizens of the, the latter's importance for the, their everyday lives. Uh, going back to the new European budget, it is beyond doubt historic. Not only because the agreement was reached following extraordinarily difficult negotiations, but also, as pointed out by Professor Crow, because it is a milestone in Union budgetary law, comparable with the Deleuze reforms from over 30 years ago. Um, one of the most remarkable features of the new MFF is the creation of Union's own resources based on new taxes, such as the one on the non-recycled plastic waste. And uh, most of the College of Europe students support the introduction of new taxes, which would directly finance the Union budgets. In the same vein, over 50% of the respondents agree with Professor Kraut's opinion that the current contributions of the member states are insufficient. Um, I would like to conclude this intervention on a more pessimistic note, uh, nonetheless. Uh, although last month the European leaders managed to reach some of the most complex agreements in the whole history of European integration, uh, the EU faced some existential threats to its own survival. Uh, following the resolution of a serious disagreement between the North and the South of the EU concerning the so-called Corona bonds, in December 2020, Poland and Hungary th threatened to veto the MFF 2021-27, including the vital recovery reforms uh, uh, measures. Uh, this worrying stalemate brought to the surface the issue which, in my opinion, is the most fundamental one for the whole of the European Union, namely political forces which undermine the European integration, the European construction from the inside. Uh, for example, according to a great number of experts, Hungary has already become 
and authoritarian state. At, at the same time, Polish judges and prosecutors who faithfully apply EU law, for example, by uh, asking uh, questions for pre preliminary rulings to the Court of Justice, face persecutions comparable to those which they would risk under the former communist regime. So it remains to be seen what happens once the rule of law conditionality mechanism, which uh, I would also be glad to hear more about in this discussion, is applied. Um, in my opinion, one cannot decide on how the union should develop and how it should be further democratized without solving the most alarming problem, which is the emergence of autocracies at its core. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frederick, for pointing your finger at a range of very crucial issues that had not yet been included in the discussions, uh, no matter how painful some of these points are, perhaps. Um, so before we take questions from the floor, uh, I would like to first give the speakers the opportunity to react to the various comments, questions, insights, observations presented by the uh, panel members. Um, I will just go in the order that, that you spoke as well. So I'd first like to ask Alexander to reply to any of the issues that the panelists raised that you would like to reply to. Thank you very much, Sasha. Um, I think basically let's start with the simplification myth of the Lisbon Treaty. While I do understand that there is now basically a greater um, uh, basically, uh, idea of ordinary and special electoral procedure. Nobody has actually ever convinced me that there is a logic to having special legislative procedures and what they add as sort of rationales and the whole principle. There rather seem to be hangovers of an older traditional system that is simply obsolete in my view. Um, and if you talk about simplification, if anybody has ever read, and quite a few of us have, but to the audience, I do recommend if you ever try to read Regulation 182 2011, the new comitology regulation, if you can detect any simplification in there, congratulations, because I can't personally see it. Um, the second basically point is the difficult jurisprudence now around um, distinguishing delegated acts and implementing in particular between as Alan rightly pointed out, between supplement and implement is mind-bogglingly complex. Even if you now read um, basically the arrangement between the institutions, it's such a high level of abstraction that it's very difficult actually to work with and decide individual cases. So one would need a further five years down the road to actually work it out, and at which point one says, well, why bother? Is there not a better system? And I entirely agree with Alan as much as I basically thought, wow, this comitology system is basically complicated. But at least it was tailored in certain respects, not ideally, but at least in its actually initial attempt to deal with different areas of rulemaking, much better than the current system does. Um, so on, on that front, simplification, I'm not yet sold on. And at the Lisbon Treaty, to some extent, I agree, but mostly not. What worries me mostly is the submarines that are swimming in the ocean of European integration that one simply doesn't see in the treaties. And those are the ones that actually drive European integration much, much more than the official text. Um, and sort of it is basically bringing those submarines up and actually say who is in it, who runs it, and why are they even out there in the ocean would basically be an interesting project to basically shed a bit more light on this. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that um, the, the court's um, ESMA ruling, I entirely agree. The court always seems to be sort of um, seems to have tried under enormous pressure politically um, to almost hand down a Sibyllinic ruling, although the ESMA ruling is unanswered, while precisely delineated is actually a concept that deals with competence. It does not actually address the more important issue around how the space that is then delegated is actually filled. Um, who are um, basically who is in it and who is not in it, in particular the stakeholder issue becomes then very important. And maybe the last point um, to make is that often you see agencies, um, for me at least in practice, have some kind of over promising role. So when you basically, for example, see the Article 17 decision in the ESMA regulation or the EBA regulation enforcement, we haven't yet, we've yet to see a single decision based on Article 17. 
which actually raises the question, is this basically like um, a, a council of medical doctors don't want to go after their own? Because when you look into the structure, the Board of Supervisors might well be reluctant to single one of its members out for infringement of the law. Is that the explanation or is it because the procedure is far too complicated to actually lead to enforcement? And maybe last point, which probably then we can engage with in the chat a bit more, the comparison with the US. I, I basically will not say because probably the question I've picked it up in the chat, we will come back to it. But there are often basically comparisons between EU agencies and US agencies that miss the crucial difference in the nature of the integration and the nature of federalism between both systems. But I'm happy to engage on that later. Thank you. Christopher. Thank you very much. Um, who is Ollie Rain? Somebody once said. Um, I want to pick up Paul's point about being able to distinguish better between the different levels, between the European level and, and the national level. I mean, this, of course, is absolutely central. This is absolutely vital, as it should be easier to attribute responsibility. It's the famous Weber quote, isn't it? That when, when everyone is responsible, no one is responsible. So being able to clarify who does what at the different levels is vitally important. Yet it's difficult. It's a huge, huge challenge because it is also essential to the working of the union that the member states are intimately involved in union level decision making. The members that the cooper active cooperation of the member states is, 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 as we all know, central to the effective working of the union. So somehow we have to find some way of distinguishing better the levels while still keeping the involvement and participation of the elected governments of the member states in union decision making. Can I can I then move on to a couple of points that Frederick raised? He brought up the um, Commission's quasi monopoly of, of, of initiative and suggested that the Parliament should have a right of initiative too. I mean, I think many important things come from the Commission's um, right of initiative. Um, and yet clearly it is a problem of democratic principle. As we all know, agenda setting, the power to structure the choice is a huge, huge component of political power. It's perhaps the most important aspect of political power. Um, second point that Frederick raised about the public sphere. Again, I think that is that that is crucial. I love the quotation from Mill in which he says that ideally in a democracy, and it's usually done by a parliament, ideally in a democracy, every single point of view should be open to challenge in adverse controversy by every other possible point of view. So, yes, developing a public sphere is important. But how do we do it? Um, I, I think we may even be making progress, by the way, but I, I can't help thinking that as we make progress, we will go perhaps through a period in which we have another problem. We create a further problem, which is I would guess that as a, pub, a European Union public sphere develops, it would mainly involve the educated, right? Um, and as we know, one of the one of the, one of the biggest one of the biggest cleavages now in our democracies is between the people who are educated to university level and those who are not. So, you know, even with a European Union public sphere, I think we will have a problem that the multilingual and the educated are perhaps going to be better, better, better placed to take part in that discussion and listen to it than the less educated. And, you know, that 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 would just play into one of the hor horrible problems in our societies, which, of course, is um, the 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 um, the deep, deep alienation of many of the less educated from things like the European Union. Thank you. Richard, uh, sorry, Michael. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yes, the Academic Research Network of EU Executive Governance, Taran and Mastery, has done a great deal in shedding light into a number of very important aspects um, in and around EU agencies um, um, and has really made a big effort in, in bringing this on the research agenda across uh, different disciplines. And the issue of um, legitimizing or EU agencies being the solution to many problems and becoming more and more maybe also problems <laughs> Um, um, of um, such as uh, Ellen Voss was pointing at um, uh, delegitimizing or actually not knowing to what extent EU decision making 
um, in EU agencies is actually sufficiently taking into account uh, the voices um, of stakeholders, of citizens, um, I think is a very, very important point. And um, it sounds also to me uh, here with EU agencies, well, thank you very much for this suggestion um, on Western Balkans that uh, the scholar I, I don't know any work of him, but I'm sure I will uh, get to know him. Um, I will write down his name on the Western Balkans. Um, it is probably then following very much the idea of one of the views of European uh, of agencies and external differentiation by uh, using EU agencies as a form of an external foreign policy tool, EU foreign policy tool uh, to, to deepen uh, the key based cooperation between Western Balkan countries uh, and the greater the, 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 the inter interdependence and the deeper the cooperation, the more incentives there are to participate. And I could imagine that there are then probably findings going into the direction that different countries have are at different levels when it comes to involvement of agencies. So I would be really interested in, in this work and know more about it. The other point, um, thank you for this. The other point I wanted to add two more things. One is uh, on delegated and implementing acts. Um, I think what we should also not forget in all of this discussion of the legitimacy of decision making in this world of legally binding non legislative acts that we are also coming a long way. I mean, we shouldn't forget that only recently we have actually a transparency register now, a register for implementing acts and delegated acts. Hooray! Yeah, so that's a very important step and that gives the opportunity now to actually start looking also for um, others outside of Brussels to look and getting interested in implementing and specifically dedicated act with their important quasi legislative nature. So I think um, and the question I'm rather more interested in here or I want to bring into the discussion is are the EU institutions and would also be uh, civil society and interest groups and so ready and fit to actually uh, uh, to 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 in, to investigate and to to scrutinize as uh, regulation 182 2011 says because as we see with implementing acts article 11 the right of scrutiny it's only the envy committee it's one particular parliamentary committee one committee making use of this power to actually scrutinize to bring up resolutions and all the other committees do not do anything with this power. So there is a power, and that brings me to Maria Jose Martinez Iglesias' uh, contribution, uh, right? Make use of the powers there are, and literally, they don't make use of what is out there. And that brings me then to the last point. Um, um, uh, Frederick, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, for your views, also from the, from the students. I think I, I, I fully share uh, what you said with regard to the disappointment with regard to the participation in the EU elections. There was the hooray on election night. It was a, on an aggregate level, a big increase and everyone was celebrating. But the day after, uh, when things became a bit clearer, it became very clear that in eight member states, actually, we had decreasing um, um, uh, turnouts. And there is still this very important social distortion of low uh, participation, which is actually much more a problem these days in the European Union. So it's not only about equal rules and equal rights um, with regard to European elections, the discussions we have when we keep on reforming the electoral law, but it's also more and more becoming actually a problem of equal opportunities. As Christopher pointed out very rightly, um, right, it is a problem that we see the social distortion of participation across the European Union in all EU member states, those that are less uh, well educated, those that do not have employment, that don't earn an income, don't have, don't earn their living, they get more and more exposed and more and more um, out of touch um, and, 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 and society uh, risks losing them in the long run, which is a risk for the future of Europe. Thank you. Richard. Thank you, Sasha. Maybe I'll pick up on the point uh, made by Frederick about the, he said students, a lot of them were in favour of European taxes. Um, I remember the former chairman of the Budgets Committee at the European Parliament, Alain Lamassoure, who is a very pro-European individual, used to say that these are two words that should never be used in the same sentence, Europe and taxes. If you want to make the Euro European Union popular, this is not the way. But nevertheless, we do have own resources, which are something um, going in the same direction. 
And the own resources decision, it just, it does leave open a lot of flexibility when we look at what can we do without changing the treaties. The own resources decision, you have a treaty provision that says the own resources decision lays down the system of own resources. There's a huge margin there to, um, to do things. But of course, it is ratified by the national parliaments, which is perfectly legitimate that they um, are the custodians of the national finances. And if, if resources are to go directly to European level, they should uh, approve it in advance. Um, I think what's interesting, he said the students were largely in favour. There have also been studies done at the European Parliament surveys, and it found actually that citizens were very much very positive towards the idea of European revenue derived from transnational activities. So things like climate taxes and single market levies on companies and so on. There is popular support for that. Um, I think if anybody is interested, the Monty group, the Monty high level group on own resources, uh, prepared a report in 2016, which can be found online, which presented this philosophy that we need resources that are linked to EU policies. And essentially it's going back to the future that back in the 70s, we had customs duties, we had agricultural levies, we had the VAT based resource. So revenue drawn from the policies that deliver public goods to European citizens. And I think that's, that's the way to legitimize um, if, if of course it's just the European income tax, it's a disaster. Uh, this is also an issue of um, taxation and representation. I know Miguel Maduro and many others before him have said that this link between the citizens and the EU revenue, it does establish this sort of link of a citizen and the entity, which um, could be good in constructing a, um, a stronger uh, sense of European citizenship and belonging. But of course, it is very delicate. Um, it, it works both ways. So also, I think what we see with the new um, plastics waste own resource is that also own resources can be used as mechanisms linked to the enforcement of policies or to incentivize the achievement of European uh, policies. And that's something also to think about for the future. And finally, on that, I would just say that um, in the Parliament, the thinking in many resolutions going back a long time is that we don't want to increase the budget per se. The objective in reforming the own resources system is rather to, re to reduce reliance on the GNI based resource and increase the genuine own resources so that the EU budget becomes more autonomous because the EU has its lawmaking powers, it has its legislative powers, um, but it, it is hampered by its lack of autonomy on the budgetary side, where every time it wants to do something, it has to go to the member states and say, please give us this um, the financing to go with it. Then on the rule of law, um, of course, it was a very, very big complication during the MFF procedure that the rule of law conditionality regulation or the regulation on conditionality in relation to the budget was linked in a package to the MFF. Um, but nevertheless, I think this ties in with the fact that if we are to make progress on the revenue side, on new own resources, it has to be shown that the money is being used well. And maybe even this is what comes first. The expenditure side has to function well. So we don't want to see waste. And of course, um, yeah, we don't want to see the EU budget being used um, by regimes which essentially are using the funds to boost their own popularity, while at the same time, uh, possibly undermining EU values. So it's a, it's a very hot issue. And I think if we're to make progress on the own resources side, we do also need to make sure that the money is well spent and that it's spent in conformity with EU rules and EU values. Thank you, Sasha. Great. So I would now like to ask Olivier to uh, report from the floor the questions that have been asked. Yes, thank you, Sasha. I had a certain number of very long questions, but I, I tried to summarize. Uh, some speakers already partially answered some questions, so sorry for the repetition. Uh, first question is from our colleague uh, Zamira Zaferi from University of Amsterdam, who was quoted by Ellen Voss uh, a bit earlier. It's a question for Alexander Turk. It's about the changes in articles uh, uh, 2090 and 2091 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU. Uh, do, did those changes lead to a stronger parliament in terms of capacity to control over the Commission? Second, com uh, second question to Alexander. Uh, the Commission likes the idea of delegation, uh, delegated act, and already in the white paper on EU governance in 2001 it was mentioned. However, concretely, the Commission has more power to adopt delegated act than implementing act. 
and, and the Commission uh, like that. So what do you think about this statement? And finally, but you already addressed that question, is there a need to change those two Article 290 and 91? Second question from Josephine Van Zeben, our colleague from uh, Wageningen University, was with us yesterday. A question to Michael uh, Kedding and Alexander Turk. Do you expect that there will be a fourth branch of agency in the EU as we see in the US? Just to decode, we have the executive power, the legislative power, the judicial power. So it's sometimes considered in the US that there is a fourth branch made of independent agencies. Are we heading toward that in the EU? The third question is from Seville Karaman, who's professor at Middle, U at Middle East Technical University. It's a question for Alexander again. As a result of its status as a customs union partner, Turkey is also a participant in EU comitology. I do not think that Turkey agentification can serve Turkey's formal integration within the EU. Any comment on that? A question which is a similar one uh, uh, by Geno uh, uh, Zubzai, who is legal advisor at the uh, council and visiting professor at the college, I guess. It was a very long question for Michael Ketting. Is Turkey really interested in getting involved in EU agency as observer? Is this is seen as an alternative to become a full member of the EU? The fifth question is from uh, Antoine Misson from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Belgium. This is a question for Paul. Uh, how a mixed assembly would help to better handle the issue of matters falling into shared competencies of the EU member states? So can you elaborate a bit uh, uh, um, uh, on that. And finally, the last question is again from uh, General Zuzai. This is a question for Richard. Why Germany has postponed the ratification of the own resource decision until mid-April 2021? Since December last year, at the highest political level, Germany had still said that it would ratify uh, that agreement very soon. Thank you. Just to confirm, Paul, because we lost your camera, did you hear the question addressed to you? You did. Okay. I'm going to pass the floor to you in a, in a moment, but just wanted to confirm that, that you understood the question. Okay. Um, Alexander, shall we start with you? Quite a number of questions. Uh, you can pick and choose what you want to address. Okay. I try to keep up basically uh, with, with uh, writing the question. So if I haven't answered anything, um, please tell me. The first question was, has Parliament now a stronger role because of the reform with Article 290 and 291? Undoubtedly, and um, this is a question probably that falls into two parts, the empirical and the theoretical. If you just look at the treaty provisions, you will get a feeling that yes, Parliament has a stronger role. But then it's a question of how you exercise your power. And so I refer back to the statement that um, Mikhail just made um, about how does Parliament use its existing powers. So one would say under 290, how is Parliament used its veto rights? How much influence has it gained? And it's often in these informal spaces where decisions happen. So member states, when 290 was introduced, suddenly woke up and said, we're not involved in the preparatory work in which we used to be involved in comitology. So member states expended a great deal of effort of actually betting involved and actually got national experts now through the door. The empirical question is to what extent parliament theoretically has a right to be involved in this work. But the empirical question is to what extent is parliament actually involved in this work or is it basically just another comitology system that favors member states over the involvement of parliament in other words just because you create a power for yourself does not answer the question of how successful you're going to use it so that's an empirical um question on the question of commission likes 290 over 291 i refer to the um interesting comments that alan made uh, uh, about basically, um, yes, on occasion in some areas, 290 is the preferred weapon of choice for the commission, but in other areas, surprisingly, it is rather 291. So that is basically one for you probably to follow up and read on and um, to shed more light on it. And then basically um, the um, final, I think third part of the question was around, should one actually come up with a new system rather than have 290 and 291 the answer to that yes very strongly from what i said i would advocate that distinction for me just hasn't worked and um, one would need to basically think through a number of principles on the basis of which one would differentiate between the various points that come within administrative rulemaking and then have a structurally differentiated and also 
differentiate procedural and basically reform, pretty much I would align myself here with Ellen to say this could be a result through a comitology um, decision um, of the old kind. Now, on the agency decision, that's quite a comparison with the US. May I just start with basically, I teach a course at Kings on US financial regulation, um, which obviously brings in Dot Frank and is a monster of an act and has also created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So, if you're interested in a very recent decision of the Supreme Court, I would basically say read Sheila Law of the Supreme Court of the 29th of June 2020 in which basically the newly well, reconfigured, more conservative Supreme Court with Justice Kavanaugh actually commented on the structure. And you will basically see how it brings the agencies closer to the president. And the president was actually empowered in Sheila's law um, to sack Ed Will, the director of the newly created CFPB. Of course, that is no longer Donald Trump, but now Joe Biden in a very ironic turn of events. Um, but the interesting thing about the Consumer Protection Bureau is it's an agency that stretches from rulemaking, not just regulatory rulemaking in the sense that no EU agency has it, all the way down to enforcement. Yet it has not used its rulemaking tools it has used to govern through enforcement mechanism of ad hoc enforcement cases. And the industry in the US is very much against that because it is not creating consistency. There is no rules on which they can rely on. It's just the ad hoc intervention of the CFPB. So powerful agencies, even though the director can sect it will, have basically quite a big roaming frequency in which they can pick and choose which space they occupy, the enforcer or the rule maker. I would not like to see this in the EU. Second difference of the EU agencies very briefly is they're horizontally much more integrated in the interinstitutional system. They're often acting um, like anacondas around the neck of the European Commission, in particular in financial regulation, where's the draft of the agency that drives the process and the Commission always feels like basically trying to catch up with it. Um, but that's not always the case. But agencies are involved in a very complex way of interacting horizontally with the Commission or other institutions. But they're also vertically integrated, which US agencies are not. So US agencies are neither horizontally integrated. They are actually standing on their own feet in their own area. But neither are they vertically integrated into the state um, system, whereas EU agencies are very integrated as well as horizontally integrated. And there is a reason for that, and it's got to do with the enhanced role of the member states in the legitimacy of the union system and the system of integration. Last question about Turkey. Uh, should you rather be in comitology and agency? Interesting question, because I had the same question when I did a training session for the Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office yesterday. And they were asking, should the UK be rather sitting in comitology committees um, as basically observers or should it be sitting in agencies? My answer was, well, you can't sit in comitology, I'm afraid, um, because you haven't signed up to anything that remotely justifies that. But should you sit in agencies? Absolutely. Um, because remember, even if Turkey sits in comitology committees, it has no voting rights. But just to follow the discussions, I would say it's not a competition, comitology or agency. I think you need to sit in both. Why? Because you pick up on the information flow and it's the information and the networking aspects of those parts of the infrastructure, institutional infrastructure of the union that is so indispensable for third country participants and, and ra rather basically forgo any voting rights, which might be actually from a formal perspective important, but from a power perspective, not as important you need to be in the center of the discussion and the information. Sorry, rather longer expose, but there were quite a few questions. Thank you. And Michael, there were some questions specifically for you as well. Would you like to address those? Alex, I answered them all, I think. <laughs> no. uh, thank you very much. I will pick up um, uh, two maybe. Uh, on the Turkey question um, specifically, um, is Turkey really interested in, in, in getting involved more in EU agencies as, as an alternative for EU enlargement? That's a very of course, important question. I asked myself this question as well. And we what we did is we actually, just to get an idea of, of how actually EU agencies are perceived in the Turkish public, 
uh, we looked at Turkish newspapers uh, systematically and actually looked to what extent these uh, 46 agencies and specifically the 34 regulatory agencies have been covered as news. Uh, knowing that two agencies here, Turkey has an observer status um, already. And it's very striking to see that over the years, actually in the last uh, five to um, five years specifically, there has been a lot of more media coverage. And it's not only on Frontex, just to be very clear. Um, it has been much more um, um, on the, uh, on the also, uh, yeah, agenda of the media, of Turkish media, reporting on the work of EU agencies, very often informing of, on reports, um, which is actually quite striking. And so I, I don't think that many would probably say right now that this is a real um, alternative to enlargement, but I think um, you could make a case by using the existing framework to bring Turkey and the EU closer. Uh, by making use of agencies and comitology committees and to actually have uh, what I said uh, earlier, right, more less this top down external perspective, um, um, uh, like this foreign um, uh, policy perspective on uh, making use of agencies and, and, and bringing um, third countries closer, but more understanding as Alex also was elaborating a little bit uh, with regard also to the UK, uh, bringing in third countries closer um, um, as a networking tool, as uh, on, on following the reasoning, right, that uh, policy failure would affect the situation uh, for each other, and that this interdependence in specific policy areas would basically uh, or could potentially define um, um, a reasoning um, for uh, for having an interest of a third country to join EU agencies. As a matter of fact, if you look, and I close with this then, uh, if you look at the uh, trade and cooperation agreement between the EU and the UK, you will see that two agencies are mentioned, right? Europol and INISA, uh, for very good reasons, but for all the other agencies, not so far. Thank you very much. Paul, there was a question specifically for you. Thank you. Just a short comment, utilization we find that is, uh, which is available in the uh, English version uh, of the uh, Piketty and others uh, proposal. But to put it briefly, I think we have to distinguish the scrutiny aspects on the one hand and possibly the more legislative aspects on the other hand, to keep it uh, clear, as far as scrutiny aspects are concerned, I think Article 69 and Article 81 of the treaties, uh, which concerns the role of national parliaments in respectively judicial cooperation and security, justice and freedom area, is a source of inspiration. There are very good reasons to uh, extend the role national parliaments keep in those areas to some of the aspects of economic and monetary uh, union, and specifically uh, the control of the um, of the uh, European semester. That would imply that the European Commission would have to present its uh, general orientation of uh, global, enfin, les grandes orientations de politique économique, as we say in French, I don't remember uh, in English, its recommendations to different acts in, 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 in the framework of uh, excessive deficit procedure to this assembly. That would not be a permanent assembly. That would not be just a, a, a new a meeting to a bit like the original uh, and the COSAC uh, national uh, cooperation between national parliaments, but with a mix of uh, national parliaments and European four, four times a year, for example. It could also, why not, and this would uh, go into the direction of Frederick's uh, proposals, uh, get this new and mixed assembly, some kind of uh, indirect legislative uh, initiative to uh, sometimes force the European Commission to submit proposals to the national parliaments on issues such as, for example, a minimal wage or a minimal uh, uh, fiscal uh, level for, for the multinationals, for example. So, th so these are some of the ideas, but just a document with more uh, concrete proposals if uh, Antoine is interested. Great, thank you. So would perhaps one of the other speakers or panel members like to react to anything that has been said? If so, please raise your hand. No. Yes, Maria. Yes, of course. Yes, I mean the um, Alexander was speaking about the empirical analysis. 
And then so I, I, I feel legitimate to take the floor on the question of uh, delegated ads because it's my day to day life. And then so uh, there is uh, an agreement on the criteria to use delegated tax between the institutions, between the, the three institutions, one year ago, a little bit more, which is the, the follow, follow up of the better lawmaking agreement of uh, 16. Or the better lawmaking agreement is the place where, in a very ambiguous way, the experts were introduced. So it's very difficult to oppose that the Commission uh, consult the expert of member states when in the same um, better lawmaking agreement, he said that the Commission has to consult broadly before uh, the presenting a delegated act. So it's normal that expert, and this, this was the consideration of the Parliament. The Parliament accepted that clearly. Or oh, all that seems to be uh, efficient because litigation about uh, delegated us has finished. There are several years without litigation, new litigation on uh, on delegated implementing acts, because there is an understanding between the, the the two branches of the legislature, and what there are discussion, of course. But then, when uh, when a decision in the legislative field is reached, well, it's happened all the time. So I mean, uh, there is an old problem in a way. The, the one or the I like very much what Michael said. We have a long path behind us. So we have to think about how was the situation 20 years ago. And delegated arts were invented because there was a need that appeared, especially in the financial services uh, process, the Lanfalusi procedure, if you remember at the time. They were inventing a kind of quasi legislative act to adapt the legislative act. To, there was not another instrument but comitology at that moment, and that put the parliament completely, completely out of the picture. So that was the origin of the of the delegated act. It's clear that uh, a big uh, novelty as that in the Lisbon Treaty needs some time to for the institutions to adapt. Once it had been happening. Uh, the, in the in the last year, but I think we we have arrived to a balanced, more or less balanced situation. There are always discrepancies, but I think I, I consider personally that there is a reason for the the different kind of acts, and the Parliament make use of the of its power on delegated acts. The question is that uh, coalitions. Uh, can arrive to the same, to the same, how can I say, to, to the same decision around a subject. I mean, the parliament is not necessarily has to be against everything uh, that some people is against. I don't know. I mean, they use his freedom as a legislator there. But I can assure you, uh, uh, parliament use its power in relation to the scrutiny of delegated that. Is that thank you very much. Maybe Christopher, Richard or Ellen, would you like to provide something further? No, Christopher, not adamantly not. <laughs> Richard. Well, I think Olivier read out a question to me from uh, Yeno about why German ratification has been postponed. Sorry. <laughs> And I really don't know. I didn't even know um, this was the case. All I can say is that the own resources decision, of course, normally takes about two years to be ratified by national parliaments. And there's a special effort being made this time to accelerate the procedure in order to allow uh, the authorization for borrowing to be adopted. And of course, parliamentarians, no matter what their governments say, don't like to rubber stamp what comes before them. And we see this at the moment in the parliament with the uh, in the European Parliament with the Brexit agreement, where it's uh, extremely, extremely difficult even just to for members just to read the text and become familiar with it in the two months available. But if there are other reasons in this, I really don't know. Ellen, would you like to say something further? No, you don't have to. <laughs> no. OK, so in that case, I would like to ask Frederick on behalf of the students to provide something of a, a final statement for this discussion. Uh, thank you, Professor Garbin. Uh, I would say to conclude that, uh, as we saw in this uh, very 
diversified uh, panel um, in terms of uh, both uh, the topics which we discuss and also of, of the speakers and panelists. Um, I would say that uh, if there's one particular thing that we should uh, remember, it is the fact that uh, the year 2020 uh, was actually one of the most important ones for uh, the whole of the European Union's history. And um, despite my fatalist, uh, uh, so to say, uh, conclusion uh, in my uh, previous reaction, uh, I would say I remain uh, even more positive than before about the EU's capacity to overcome various crises. And I think the, the agreement on the multiannual financial framework, which uh, just uh, entered into force uh, one month ago, is uh, the best example. Um, and uh, also uh, referring back to what was also discussed uh, a few minutes ago, uh, I think I also, I'm also positive that uh, uh, the EU already since the adoption of the Lisbon Treaty has created legal foundations which actually leave uh, quite a lot of space for reforms that we need and that could be agreed on uh, even uh, without introducing again new treaties but instead we could stick to what we uh, already have as uh, the uh, fundamental foundations and concentrate on slow re reforming and uh, enhancing the uh, European construction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frederick. I, I think it bears testimony to all your radiant personalities and engaging presentations and comments that on a Friday afternoon, after two days of digital conference and in this panel discussing things like the budget and comatology and agencies, we still have over, if we take into account the live stream, uh, more than 170 uh, participants. So I think that is really an accomplishment that I would like to thank uh, all of the, the speakers and the uh, panelists and the audience themselves uh, for. Um, what we will be doing now is we've actually managed, can you believe it or not, but to uh, be a little bit ahead of schedule. Is that a first for you in a co big conference? For me, it's a first, I think. Um, so what we will do is soon the IT will act with the hand of God and take out the speakers and the panelists from this session and put back in to the room um, Inge and Karine alongside myself and Olivier and we will be doing the wrap up uh, together. Um, so that just means that uh, I would like to ask IT to proceed with that and a round of applause for uh, our speakers and panelists. Thank you very much. Great, so this is the closing session. Uh, I think I will first pass the floor. Uh, who would like to go first? I think you, Sasha, if you want to. Shall I do the, shall I do the, the conclusion? So some of some concluding remarks now? Okay. So um, I, without hopefully butchering the richness of the discussions we've had over the past two days, um, I would like to try and just summarize or at least share with you some general thoughts that have struck me um, listening to all the excellent interventions. So first I would like to make a preliminary point, then I have three sort of substantive points, and then I would just like to uh, recap on the concrete recommendations for change that have been made. So my preliminary point is the following, and I guess it was inevitable uh, in a digital room full of lawyers, politicians and political scientists, but we all seem to agree very much that language 
matters, that narratives matter, that linguistic concepts matter a great deal. Um, and various speakers in various fields have argued for a shift of narrative or a shift of the use of language in their respective areas. So yesterday we saw Elspeth Guild very passionately resisting the term migrant and arguing that it should instead be third country national for very good reason, I think, and also resisting the narrative around, uh, around push and pull uh, uh, reasons for migration. Um, we also saw, uh, as regards digitalization, Andrea Renda and Paul Nimitz take issue with this narrative fostered by the tech companies that the law, inept, slow, rigid as it is, needs to adapt and learn to adapt to technology. And rather, they say it's the other way around. Uh, technology just needs to adapt to the law. Uh, so again, a shift in, in narrative and conceptualization. Um, Amandine Crespi, with regard to the social market economy, she said, we need to stop this kind of narrative with these two juxtaposing forces of, on the one hand, economic competitiveness, and on the other hand, social progress, because they, they don't oppose each other. They, we need to think about the ways in which they can go hand in hand and, and support each other. Um, and Josephine van Zeben. Uh, exposed that behind this narrative of fuel poverty and energy poverty, which sounds like a very sort of social concern, actually often lurks corporate interest uh, that resists, uh, you know, big energy companies basically internalizing the cost of energy use. Um, we had our own Olivier Costa argue for a new narrative in um, uh, it, it, with regard to European elections and seeing that as, uh, you know, a, a way to maybe start fostering the European demos that we need, right? Um, I myself, finally, would like to dispose of one narrative that we have uh, at EU level, uh, which Ig and I also published a book on, uh, which is the better regulation agenda, which is a, a very, very self-flagellating, self-punishing narrative that portrays EU standards and EU rules by default as burdensome and in a very bad light. I mean, the public consultation and participation elements of better regulation may be great, but uh, this idea that EU rules legitimately adopted in the interest of the citizens through the legislative process, which we have agreed throughout these two days, should actually be used more and should be celebrated, should not be portrayed as something negative. So that's a final narrative for me that can go straight into the bin. OK, so I'll be shorter now on the three points of, of substance. Um, I, I did see some consensus emerge, uh, first of all, on the point that we need to, it was stated in different terms by different speakers, but to reinstate the law in a range of fields, fields to reappropriate the law, it was said, to rehabilitate the law. Um, or to combat the breakdown of the rule-based system. Um, so basically, it's to reassert, uh, you know, the law, the legal over the political, as Karine also said in, in her excellent observations earlier this afternoon. And then um, the second sort of general insight where there was less consensus, there was quite a bit of debate also this morning, um, is to what extent the law should also prime policies. And, and, and there I refer to the discussions we've had about mainstreaming or coupling or um, the coherence, constitutional coherence of all policies of the EU, where on the one hand, we saw yesterday uh, Olivier de Schutter and Amandine Crespi argue that uh, you know the rule of law and that and social considerations need to be mainstreamed in all areas of EU decision making. And they again pinpoint that the European semester as a powerful vehicle for that. 
but we also saw this morning uh, Jacques Pelkmans and uh, Philippe de Barre uh, very much oppose this type of, of coupling and, and uh, they, they, they don't want the power of the EU's trade policy to be diluted by the EU's weaknesses in regard of some other uh, policy objectives, no matter how important or constitutionally validated they were, are. Yet that opposition then was opposed, uh, I think, by, uh, by Inge, by um, Christophe Fillon, and also by Ramses Vessel, the, the latter who uh, insisted forcefully um, that human rights are the foundations of the entire EU system, which I, I like very much. And of course, that, that, that goes back to some of the remarks I made at the beginning of the, of the conference. Um, then the third sort of general point where there is both disagreement and consensus, I guess, and maybe some further reflection is needed, is as to the, the, the way that our three EU institutions, the Council, the Parliament and the Commission, how they interact, what their powers are in this transnational constitutional democracy. And maybe that when we think about reforms as to one or the other institution, that we need to really think about their placement and their interaction in that system. Of course, let's not forget the European Court of Justice in that regard either. Um, so, I mean, as the regards to the Council, I do think there was a bit of a consensus that you know we have a persistent problem of executive dominance. So we somehow need to reduce uh, the influence of the member states in the, in the European Council, Council of Ministers, per se. But um, how to do it is is not always obvious especially how that then relates to the powers of the European Parliament, powers of the national parliaments. There wasn't always consensus among our various, and there shouldn't be, I guess, but uh, there is there is fruitful disagreement about how to, how to uh, proceed with reforms of the EP in that regard and the national parliament's role in, in European Union decision-making. I guess one of the points though, that I find that we need to explore further that wasn't necessarily reflected as much on in, in the conference, but it did come up in the previous uh, session uh, in relation to Olivier's uh, presentation is the role of the Commission, because it is it's such a crucial actor, obviously, but it's entirely unclear at the moment what it's rationale and what its sort of source of legitimacy now really is. Is it technocratic? Um, is it supposed to become, you know, a political actor, as, as Olivier has been arguing? But how does that sit with its constitutional role, guardian of the treaties and protector of the common interest? And, you know, trying to perhaps um, really milk those unique elements of the EU's transnational constitutional democracy that we need. So I, I think we need to reflect a little bit better on that and, and, and the way forward for the European Commission out of some of these contradictory expectations and rationales that we have for it. Okay, and then just to, to reiterate uh, the, uh, the sort of wish list put forward. That range is very much from uh, things we can do without treaty change to things that we might do, indeed need to change the treaty for. Um, I think there was a, a call powerfully by Catherine Owl and, and also others that this, this whole process, of course, should not be about tokenism. You know, we really should be doing something um, at the same time, I, I would also say that there are no real low hanging fruits, even the things that we need to do or should be doing without treaty change that I'll mention in a moment are still going to be very difficult to do. And why is that? Well, because we are in this catch 22 that the reasons why we need to change things are precisely why we cannot change things, right? So I mean, to reduce executive dominance, we need to reduce executive dominance. So this is where we're stuck. And I'm not entirely sure if, if we can find easily a way out of that to procure even the smaller sort of non-treaty change changes um, that have been put forward. But that aside, um, what do our various speakers think that needs to happen? So we need, first of all, this process that we're doing, this Conference on the Future of Europe, should become a permanent fixture of the landscape, says Alberto Alemano. Um, and then perhaps presided by Calypso Nicolaides, said, uh, said Olivier Costa. 
Um, we need to mainstream in the, like I said already, in the European semester, uh, the rule of law, uh, social issues, fundamental rights. Um, and as Diane Fromage said, we need to involve national parliaments more in the European semester. Okay. Um, various speakers, Ramses Vessel, Richard Crow, and others said, uh, and Maria Jose Iglesias Martinez said, we need to use the passerelle. We have these fantastic little magical gateways in the treaty. Let's use them. Uh, of course, once again, you need unanimity to use to get over unanimity. So it's that same catch 22, right? The reason why you need the passerelle is the reason that you cannot use the passerelle, but okay. Um, I would fully support that. Of course, I myself have been arguing we need to extend the use of the OLP as much as possible. So use the passerelle for that, change the treaty for that, just in all ways possible, extend the use of the OLP, um, which was also something that our own student, uh, 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 Frédéric uh, Lachaise, mentioned just before. Um, Olivier, of course, has made a very powerful call for the tra transnational list and the Spitzenkandidaten, um, which on the Spitzenkandidaten, not everybody seems in agreement, but I, I do think that, that there is a lot to say also for that, obviously. And then we go more into firm, uh, profound constitutional change territory with a green card for the national parliaments, for the right of initiative, for the European parliament, for a secondary parliamentary chamber to be uh, created at European parliament level, and for merging articles 290 and 291, as we just saw in the previous session. Um, and to recognize specifically and regulate the role of agencies in, in the EU constitution. So um, I, I think, you know, we've done really well uh, to be both uh, as academics are, you know, strict and, and critical and think about all the things that don't work, um, but to also be constructive, as Inge reminded us yesterday that we need to be. And uh, we, we've come up with a, a nice list of things to be taken into uh, consideration. So uh, I think that, uh, Inge, you're going to thank some people that need to be thanked, right? So uh, I'm not gonna do that at this stage, um, but uh, yeah, for, for me, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Sasha. I will also leave uh, to Inge the, the role of thanking all the people who were involved in that conference. It has been great. Just a very short word. Uh, the objective of our conference was to think about the challenge of the future of Europe and, and to bring some substantial proposal in this respect. And our objective, let's be very clear, is to influence the deliberation of the conference on the future of Europe uh, uh, with the views of experts and, and academics. Uh, we still don't know how that conference will be uh, concretely organized. Will it start on the 9th of May? I don't know. And it's a bit ironic that the conference on the future of Europe is currently late, not because only of the COVID, but because also uh, of the dispute between the main EU institution and within them. So it's a clear demonstration. It's an absurd demonstration that there is really a need for a place to think independently about the future of, of the EU, European policies, European politics, within being trapped by those interinstitutional, political and intergovernmental uh, games. And so it's very important in my view that we academics, we experts, we civil society people provide the member of that conference with ID. That's why we're going to publish the great papers that were presented those two days in the European Law Journal, but certainly Karine will say a, a word about it. Watch for it. Thank you. Okay, here I am. <laughs> so thank you very much, Olivier, for these words. And thank you very much, Sasha, for this beautiful synthesis. Um, as a conclusion, indeed, I would like to read um, uh, I would like to read a little text, which I think will put into perspective the publication of the conference proceedings in the European Law Journal. We hope for the papers that are currently being drafted on the basis of this conference to be available by April or May at the very latest. So when and before the actual conference on the future of Europe will start in order to uh, foster debate as well. So here's a little text. 
The European Union seems to be at a crossroads. Do or die would sum it up in all its eloquent crudeness, pressured by the unstoppable course of an accelerating history and faced with multiple crises. The EU is summoned to spell out what it stands for. Defining European integration through action is the challenge of the 21st century for a European Union of the willing, whether one believes in it or thinks of it as the lesser of all evils. European scholarship is thus also at a crossroads. It can continue to write the most beautiful swan songs about European disintegration by describing the EU in a purely doctrinal fashion or by explaining in a contextual fashion and albeit with exquisite sophistication the multiple endogenous and exogenous crises that have hit our European vessel while it is sinking. Alternately, it can decide to participate in a collective effort to craft European integration in order to tackle contemporary challenges. This requires first to reconnect with the with the pioneering spirit that characterized the beginnings of the European adventure, with the understanding that pioneering, after all, is not a phase, but a necessary state of mind, even more so for those who do not wish to surrender to a polarizing false fatalism. Second, it means to keep the questioning acquis and inquisitive spirit inherent in a critical approach, albeit one that goes beyond mere deconstruction. Such an approach opens the floor to its necessary reformist counterpart. Indeed, taking conceptualization seriously means shedding an original light on some puzzling issues, while also providing an innovative framework in which to rethink problems and find new keys to solve them. Right now, in our field, there is probably no larger and more pressing issue than the future of the European Union. To not actively engage with this debate would be tantamount to a self-confinement in a decontextualized solipsistic world, as if adopting a critical distance toward the European object of study would immunize scholars from influencing its course or from questioning the impact of their own stance. Lastly, and perhaps even more importantly, it would contribute, willingly or not, to conceding victories either to growing waves of Euroscepticism philia framed in the dangerous illiberal narratives of a post-truth world, or to a European melancholia and trapped into a disillusioned Weltanschauung. The editorial line of the European Law Journal is based on the conviction that the European Union, although neither an end in itself nor a panacea, represents one of the best means at our disposal to ensure a European, if not global, liberal and sustainable way of life. This is what the European Law Journal stands for. This is an excerpt from uh, the last uh, European Law Journal editorial. So this explains pretty clearly this con that, uh, that this conference as a collaborative project between the European Law Journal and the College of Europe, because we do share the same philosophy, interdisciplinarity and the coming together of scholars and practitioners or even members of civil society as a source of enrichment. And we do humbly hope through the organization of this conference to create a momentum towards taking the conference on the future of Europe seriously for it to be a true democratic exercise. The president of the European Parliament, David Sassoli, mentioned yesterday that he would be back at the College of Europe for a midterm review of the conference on the future of Europe and possibly another brainstorming. We hope that by then, the Conference on the Future of Europe will have triggered a whole array of thought-provoking contributions from practitioners, scholars, civil society and citizens directly. In the meantime, thank you very much to the College of Europe for this wonderful collaboration. Olivier Costa for the Political Science Department, Inge Gover and Sasha Gaben for the Law Department and Rector Federica Mogherini. Thank you to all our speakers and panelists and attendees as well. It has been a privilege and a pleasure to listen and debate with you. And without further ado, I leave the floor to Inge to uh, give some last thanks to our members of the College of Europe, I guess, and others. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karine. Uh, I've been tasked by my co-organizers with the most difficult uh, task, which is uh, to thank everyone involved 
because of course such a huge conference would not have been possible without the input of many many people but it's a big responsibility because of course we're bound to forget one or the other name so in advance already i would like to thank everyone who was from far or from close by involved in the organization of this conference but in particular i would like to also thank my co-organizers you see here on the screen Ken Corns from the European Law Journal. Uh, I think it was a fine collaboration with the College of Europe and uh, Sasha Gerben, of course, uh, in the law department. We worked together on a daily basis. Uh, and it was also very nice to be able to work with you for this conference. But Olivier, it was uh, a huge success, I would say, to have the collaboration between law and politics and something that can definitely be done again also in the future. So I'd also like to thank the politics department uh, for their uh, help and their assistance uh, and their collaboration in this uh, project. Now, two people behind the scenes have been incredibly active and you have not seen them, but without them, it would not have been possible, but really not to organize this conference. And that is Valerie Housby. Uh, the Secretary in the Legal Studies Department and Jonas from the IT Department of the College of Europe who have been uh, streamlining this conference. So a big thanks uh, really to both of them and also to the whole IT service of the college and to all the assistants of law and politics who have been involved, of course, in setting up this conference. Also big thanks to Rector Mogherini, who from the start has also given her um, with warm support to this uh, project and to President Sassoli for having readily accepted to give the speech and to stay with us, not just to deliver his speech, but also to interact with the audience, I thought in a very frank manner. So a big thanks also to him. Then of course, a very big and really warm felt thanks to all our speakers and discussants and also the chairs that have uh, given their experience and insights and have also readily interacted. So a big thanks to all of you and we look forward to the written output, uh, which will be fueled, of course, also by the discussions that were had through the impulse of the audience. And I would like to finish by thanking the audience. Uh, it was a huge success. We have said it several times. We had more than 1,400 registrations, which means that a lot of uh, you have followed the conference also through stream and not directly uh, connected to the system. Um, a very big thanks for having assisted. It shows that the future of Europe is alive, lives and is going to live on. And I would also like to extend the invitation as uh, Olivier and Karim and uh, Sasha have also done to keep involved with the European Union to claim ownership of the future of Europe and to bear responsibility for the direction that we take in the future. And with these words, I formally, officially close the conference. A big thanks to all of you and I look forward to the next conference on the future of Europe, hopefully in not too long. <laughs> thanks to all.